Greetings and welcome to IHPC Connects. I'm Tracy Bowen, Executive Director of the Integrative Health Policy Consortium, IHPC. Today's webinar is one in a series of educational briefings that IHPC will be hosting in the coming months for our health professionals and our friends and colleagues on Capitol Hill. IHPC is a nonprofit organization that represents more than 650,000 state licensed and nationally certified healthcare professionals. Our mission is to eliminate barriers to health for all. And among our important work is to champion the bipartisan Congressional Integrative Health and Wellness Caucus on Capitol Hill. Today, we will hear from an important thought leader, Dr. Aline Langevin, Director of NCCIH, who will present on research for integrative and whole person health. I wish to thank our IHPC sponsors, the Samueli Foundation, Sapphire Essentials, Upledger Institute International, and Cairo Secure. We are so deeply appreciative of their support for IHPC's work. Some quick housekeeping. You may submit written questions during the webinar by clicking on the Q&A icon at the bottom of your screen's taskbar at the right side. We'll get to as many questions as possible today. This program is being recorded and will be available at IHPC.org later. Now, it is my pleasure to introduce today's moderator, Dr. Margaret Chesney, a professor of medicine at the University of California at San Francisco. Dr. Chesney served as the first deputy director of NCCIH and has served as the chair of the Academic Consortium for Integrative Medicine and Health. Prior to working at NIH, she served as the principal investigator in numerous projects and clinical trials that investigated non-pharmacological approaches to health promotion and treatment. She has published over 350 scientific papers based on this research. Dr. Chesney is a member of the National Academy of Medicine. In addition, she has held numerous leadership positions, including being president of the Society of Health Psychology of the American Psychological Association and president of the Academy of Behavioral Medicine Research. We are honored that Dr. Chesney serves as a senior advisor to IHPC. With that, I present Dr. Chesney. Thank you so much, Tracy. And it's my honor to introduce Dr. Henlein Lajevan, the director of the National Center for Complementary and Integrative Health at the NIH. I first met Helen uh, when I was acting director of NCCIH. The center was hosting a meeting of the leading acupuncture scientists in the United States, Europe, and China for a high level scientific exchange. And I recall her presentation vividly, her insightful research questions, the creative approach she took to her science and her thoughtful conclusions. And at that time, she was a professor in the Department of Neurological Sciences at the University of Vermont. Later in 2013, when I was director of the UCSF Usher Center for Integrative Medicine, I served on the search committee for the new director of the Harvard Osher Center. And I was so pleased that Helen was selected for that position. Then in November, 2018, Dr. Langevin was appointed the director of NCCIH. Today, she will share her vision for the center as it is developing its strategic plan for the next five years. So join me in welcoming Dr. Langevin who will share her screen with all of us now. After she speaks, there will be a Q&A session. And if anyone has a question, please write it in the Q&A icon, which is I think on the right or at the bottom of your screen. Thank you so very much and welcome Helen. Thank you so much, uh, Dr. Chesney, it's a very kind introduction, and it's my great pleasure to be uh, speaking uh, at this uh, wonderful event of, of IHPC. Now, the Inter Integrative Health Policy Consortium is a, a lot about integration, and my talk is going to be about integration as well. So here, is, here are my slides. 
One second. Yeah. There we go. Can you all see my slides? Yes, I hope. Yes. Yes, excellent. Okay. So um, my talk today is about integrative and whole person health and why this is not only important, but also actually urgent. And I will begin by uh, share, showing this alarming graph that I'm sure many of you have seen. It was published in JAMA of last year, showing that life expectancy in the United States has now declined for three years in a row. And this is especially shocking compared with other countries that are spending much less than the United States on healthcare. And a big component of this massive increase in, in deaths is, I mean, is a massive increase in deaths due to overdoses, uh, especially opioids. And we also know that a major contributor to the opioid crisis has been a pain crisis with more than 50 million Americans living with chronic pain, uh, many of which continue to be prescribed opioids to manage their pain. And we also know that 10% of suicides occur in people with chronic pain. We also have an obesity epidemic that is affecting 34% of adults and 17% of children. And this contributes to the increased mortality uh, due to diabetes and hypertension. And now we have the COVID-19 pandemic, which we know um, disproportionately affects people with obesity, diabetes, and hypertension. So, Clearly, it doesn't take a big stretch of the imagination to hypothesize that there might be factors uh, tying these things together. Now, social economic disparities, including education, housing, environmental pollution, access to healthcare, are all important factors uh, that have been receiving uh, long overdue and increasing uh, attention. But in this talk, I will be focusing on another factor that I believe has been overlooked and that I will call healthcare non-integration. So what do I mean by that? Have you ever any of you experienced going to the doctor and feeling like you were treated like an arm or a leg or a stomach or some other disconnected body part? And now the reason uh, for this is that really the, the predominant approach of, of medicine is really to treat diseases of separate organ systems as though they are independent of each other. Now in this talk, I will argue that an important part of the solution to the terrible confluence of health crises that we are currently uh, experiencing in this country is to instead focus on the health of the whole person. So let's first see how this thing uh, came about. Now, whenever you, if in any type of science, uh, whether you're doing um, biology or medicine or even philosophy, um, there's always these two separate sort of uh, currents, countercurrents of analysis and, and synthesis, right? Analysis is, is when you break things down into smaller and smaller components, and synthesis is when you uh, put them back together. Now, this really started very early on, uh, say uh, back, way back at the beginning, uh, at the end of the 19th century, when uh, the various different organ systems of the body were uh, discovered. You know, so, um, for example, you know, circulation, res respiratory system, digestive system, et cetera. And uh, so there was this kind of compartmentalization of medicine into these various different systems that determine the structure of say academic departments or medical specialties. Now within these systems, uh, people started looking more and more detailed as for, I say within each organ system, people look up research starting to examine different types of cells that made up these organs. And then within each cell, all the different cellular um, uh, molecular pathways um, that uh, sort of underline all the different more and more and more detailed uh, processes that we now understand as uh, the bio, you know, biochemistry that underlies so many of the, uh, of the uh, physiological processes that we now understand. Now, the thing is that when you are focusing so much on the biochemical uh, nature of things, 
the natural uh, types of treatments that uh, derive from this are biochemical, meaning drugs, right? And so our approach, which has been so analytic in trying to understand more and more and more precisely um, the sort of uh, uh, molecular events that occur uh, during uh, disease have led to a predominantly pharmacological approach to treatment. Now, I'm going to illustrate this uh, with a story. So um, this is a 50-year-old uh, female with type 2 diabetes. She's overwhelmed, uh, overweight with a BMI of 30, and efforts to control her uh, blood sugar with diet have so far been uh, unsuccessful. Her doctor starts her on metformin and then uh, glipizide, which has kept her hemoglobin A1C within the normal range for the past two years, although her BMI is now 32. She has a 10-year history of hypertension that was controlled with hydrochlorothiazide until six months before uh, when uh, an ACE inhibitor was added. This was uh, discontinued two months later uh, due to a persistent dry cough and a beta blocker was added to her regimen. Her blood pressure is still slightly elevated. The cough symptoms improved after discontinuing the ACE inhibitor, but have now com not completely subsided. She also has osteoarthritis of her right knee, managed with Motrin and Tylenol for acute exacerbation. She has a long history of anxiety, uh, difficulty sleeping, and intermittent epigastric pain attributed to gastroesophageal reflux. She's been prescribed Ambien to take as needed for sleep and Prilosec, for her heartburn. She's concerned that her GI symptoms are due to one of her diabetes medications, but was strongly encouraged to stay on these since they are successfully controlling her blood sugar. She also has a slight iron deficiency anemia, which is being worked up for a GI source. And she was told to discontinue Motrin and take Tylenol instead. Now imagine this same patient 30 years later in a nursing home. Her diabetes and hypertension are still under reasonable control uh, with a total of four medications, but her insomnia and chronic knee pain are increasingly problematic. She's not been able to sleep at all without medication for many years. She's had some cognitive decline, daytime somnolence, and worsening anxiety. In an attempt to wean her from her benzodiazepines, she was started on trazodone uh, with some benefit, but has recently developed worsening tachycardia, which is being evaluated. She had a GI bleed from erosive gastritis in her mid-60s and can no longer take NSAIDs. And she has needed stronger analgesics to control her knee pain, including occasional opiates for acute exacerbation. Now, what's wrong with this all too familiar picture? This patient is suffering from having been broken down into separate body parts, and each of her problems is treated as a separate disease. And the resulting polydiagnoses and polypharmacy creates an additional layer of drug-induced pathology. Um, I would argue that failure to understand this, the importance of seeing this patient as a whole person has led to her being treated using a fragmented disease-focused model that encourages a reliance on pharmacologically controlling separate diseases rather than restoring health. This is a serious problem. Now the solution is obviously right, to point the arrow back to the patient, but that's not so easy to do. Now, recently there's been a lot of talk about various ways that this could be, that integration could happen. And there's been a lot of, of, of uh, conversations about personalized medicine and whole person medicine and individualized medicine and precision medicine. Now, early on, personalized medicine uh, really was referring to the whole person, sort of a biopsychosocial uh, approach to, uh, pa to patient care. But more lately, uh, lately, there's been a, a kind of a, a confusion between the precision medicine, which is really kind of taking an individualized approach to, uh, to prescribe treatments based on, for example, uh, genomic uh, markers or various different uh, biochemical characteristics for individual patients. And so the term personalized and precision has been sort of um, kind of confused and, and lumped together. Um, I think that it's very important to recognize the importance of the biopsychosocial uh, perspective when, when talking about 
personalized. And so in order to not use the word to a word that could be confused with precision, uh, we're proposing that the word whole person or term whole person might be uh, more clear and, uh, and, and, and sort of less confusing. Now, of course, it's not to say that there hasn't been any synthesis or integration going on uh, in research. Of course, there has been. And since the beginning, uh, pointing the arrow back the other way, putting things together, understanding the pathophysiology of, 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 of diseases has always been, uh, you know, a, a great uh, uh, important uh, theme in medical research. And, and lately, there's been a, a greater emphasis of, of trying to understand how the various systems and organs of the body may interact. Systems biology, for example, is an important uh, uh, approach where, where people are really starting to understand that something like inflammation, for example, can affect various systems in the body. Also, uh, genome-wide uh, association studies. Are, now we're an increasing recognition that it's not just one gene, one disease. Very often you have groups of genes, for example, that interact uh, to, to influence somebody's predisposition to something like you know, diabetes, for example. So of course, you know, this has been an ongoing uh, uh, quest uh, towards balancing the analysis uh, with the synthesis. An interesting area in this, uh, in this uh, field is the field of interoception, or the way that the nervous system uh, perceives uh, interprets and, uh, and integrates, right, the signals uh, coming from the various organs of the body, for example, the gut, the lung, et cetera. And at NCCIH, we're very interested in this area because it is really uh, very integrative in a sense that it, uh, it sort of puts the body uh, back together. But importantly, um, there's other ways that, that the brain does not necessarily have to be at the center of things, right? Uh, where if you, um, the gut, for example, we are starting to now understand so much more about uh, the, for example, the role of the microbiome in the gut and how, what goes on with the foods that we eat and the, the, the microbiome that we have inside us and also uh, other types of metabolic and, or immune responses can have effects on multiple immune system, uh, organ systems, including the brain. And so you could also, so you could think about this in a sort of what we call, you know, we say gut centric or even uh, musculoskeletal centric. There are also, there are various different uh, types of approaches to uh, manual medicine, uh, for example, in osteopathy, where there's a sense of, of thinking about the musculoskeletal system as kind of the point of entry for understanding the pathophysiology of many, uh, of many conditions. And so um, it's interesting to see how these various different ways to think about the body could sort of map out onto three kind of what we call large categories of, of uh, the non-pharmacological you know, approaches to, uh, to treatment, sort of dietary, psychological, and physical. And um, we have, at NCCIH, we've been sort of mapping uh, the various different types of complementary therapies onto these various domains. And this has generated a lot of really interesting conversations. Um, and also how do these domains interact with each other? How do they interact with other domains that are more conventional? For example, the interaction of the dietary do domain with pharmaceutical drugs. Uh, if you take, for example, a, a nutritional supplement or a natural product, but you increase the dose to the point where you're actually using it as a drug, right, to treat a specific disease, um, then there's not a whole lot of difference between that and a drug. On the other hand, if you think about uh, food components or uh, botanicals or probiotics that are taken more in the types of doses that are, that are common, in, that could be in a, in a food, for example, then they're not so much being used as a, as a drug, but they're more used as a component of the diet. So, there's this very interesting uh, um, to think about how uh, these, these categories um, overlap. The psychological category is of course very interesting because uh, in this category belong a lot of what some of the, what we call the mind and body practices, meditation, for example, cognitive behavior therapy, mindfulness-based stress reduction. Um, and the fact that some of these kind of overlap with more conventional, for example, psychotherapy, and that sometimes there's a blurring of the lines between the conventional and the complementary. 
um, for example, CBT, cognitive behavior therapy, increasingly incorporates, which is a more of a on the conventional side, but incorporates elements of relaxation techniques, meditation, et cetera. There's also interesting overlap between the psychological and the dietary in the form of mindful eating. Now, what about the physical category? And this is also a very interesting uh, category from the point of view of complementary therapies manual therapies, for example, massage and, and sort of spinal manipulation, chiropractic care, for example, would, would belong there. But there's some interesting uh, overlap here between the psychological and the physical. Something like yoga and Tai Chi have a very strong psychological component, including meditation, focusing on the breathing, but uh, there's a physical component as well. And then acupuncture sits in this very interesting uh, place here kind of interact between psychological, as we know there's a strong psychological component to acupuncture, it's physical as well, but then acupuncture needles are devices, right? And so this kind of interacts with this kind of device category here that it would include things like um, transcranial magnetic stimulation or light therapy. So looking at these, these types of, uh, these, these, these um, complementary therapies one by one, uh, is interesting and, and mapping them out onto these categories. But it's also interesting to think about how these uh, therapies are used, not simply one at a time, but also in combinations and to what we call multimodal uh, interventions. So here's an example. So for example, this is a more or less sort of conventional, uh, I would say type of cardiac rehabilitation uh, that would incorporate a dietary component di uh, and an exercise, but there may also be a psychological component, a mindfulness-based stress reduction, for example, which is very increasingly being um, uh, uh, used in, for example, patients recovering from uh, acute myocardial events. But then you could have also a, a little slightly more uh, kind of complementary uh, uh, version of this where you would use Tai Chi, uh, which is now increasingly being incorporated in some cardiac rehab uh, programs. Now, importantly, in this, in this, the two examples I've just showed, what ties these three uh, uh, um, types of uh, interventions together in a multimodal therapy uh, still falls more or less under the sort of conventional way of thinking about, uh, you know, uh, physiology and, 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 and medicine. But there are other ways. For example, um, the traditional Chinese medicine, right, which is definitely a multimodal, what we call a therapeutic system uh, that includes dietary components like food, herbal formulas. It would have, a, a, a tai, for example, a physical component with Tai Chi, a, a soft tissue manipulation, Tuina, and then maybe some hot or cold application. And then, of course, acupuncture, which, as we said before, it kind of sits in between a lot of these different categories. But the important difference between something like traditional Chinese medicine and say the cardiac rehabilitation program that I uh, mentioned earlier is that there is some difference in what ties these uh, interventions together. There's a diagnostic and therapeutic framework um, that underlies how these treatments are used together in traditional Chinese medicine, which is different from that of conventional medicine. And so this is important to, to understand that from the point of view of research, um, if we were to do research on one of these components, for example, acupuncture, um, but we would not be using it in the context of traditional Chinese medicine um, with the point of, with, from the point of view of how the acupuncture treatment is, is based uh, on, on a specific diagnosis or a specific theoretical rationale, we may be missing something important. Now, one of the areas that I, I think is very important uh, for, uh, for um, int that integrative health is situated, is kind of at the boundary between conventional medicine and uh, complementary and sort of the, 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 the sphere of complementary uh, therapies and multimodal therapeutic systems. I think that integrative health is at a, is at a very interesting place there. And that kind of when you're at the boundary of things, it, it's an opportunity to really kind of shed light on a, on a system, for example, of conventional medicine that can reveal insights that, uh, that, were not, uh, that were not previously there. So what would be an example of this? Well, uh, for example, we know that conventional medicine has blind spots. 
uh, there's places in, in conventional medicine that really have been sort of uh, ignored. And a great example of that is what I have been doing research on my whole uh, career, which is connective tissue. Um, there's very little mention if you were to open a textbook of, of rheumatology or, or orthopedics and look uh, and, and find, you're lucky if you find a paragraph on connective tissue, even though it is a component of the musculoskeletal system, um, it, it hasn't really been studied very much. On the other hand, if you ask somebody who does massage uh, 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 or in any type of manual therapy, really, uh, myofascial release, for example, if they think connective tissue is important, um, there's a there's a re get a recognition of the role of connective tissue, or something people call it fascia, um, in in what they do, in in what they what they perceive they are doing with their patients, and so um, this has been a very interesting area that uh, of the area of connective tissue or fascia research has very much been illuminated by insights. Uh, from the uh, complementary uh, manual therapies, like for example, Rolfing. Um, now, another e example of where uh, complementary therapies uh, have, have illuminated uh, sort of uh, uh, new, uh, new aspects of physiology is connections between things. Um, if you were to ask somebody who does uh, yoga, for example, is it possible that how you breathe influences your digestive system? I think a lot of people would say, yes, probably. But if you do a PubMed search for anything respiratory and anything digestive, um, you will find almost nothing. And so this is another opportunity for us to understand, for example, uh, research on yoga or different types of breathing techniques to try to, to, to really expand our understanding of the connections that may exist between, say, the digestive and, and, and the respiratory system. Now, finally, I'm gonna talk about these multimodal therapeutic systems and what they can teach us from a diagnostic standpoint, because I think this is an area we don't really talk about very much. If you were to look at this sort of little constellation of, of, uh, of what I would call signs and symptoms here, this is, imagine this is a patient and every one of these little symbols represents a, a sign or a symptom here. If you were to look at this patient, you may sort of see it sort of a a predominant of red, right? And you may, be con uh, may conclude that this patient has a red disease, right? But if you were to turn off the colors and you look at the shapes, um, you would see a predominance of squares, right? And so you might say, well, maybe this patient has a square disease instead. So by changing the diagnostic filter, you may be able to look at this patient in a completely different way. And this is, uh, you can sort of illustrate this better if you kind of highlight the, the, the um, the, the circles uh, differently. So um, this is th the point I'm trying to make here is that uh, a multimodal therapeutic system, such as say traditional Chinese medicine that looks at the patient uh, using uh, a different filter to uh, interpret the patient's signs and symptoms uh, could really illuminate um, a different uh, aspect of the person's uh, uh, disease or problem. So going back to um, sort of our analysis and synthesis, um, clearly, whoops, uh, sorry, moving ahead of myself. Um, so far, what I've talked about is very much the importance of the whole person. But what about health? Because what I'm talking about today is whole person health, right? So, so much, so far I've talked about the whole person. So let's talk about health now. So if you would uh, consider uh, these two plants, um, the one on the left uh, is looks healthy enough, and the the one on the right uh, looks like it sort of has some sort of disease, right? But what about the one in the middle? Um, it doesn't look quite healthy. Um, you have a sense that uh, it if it got perhaps a little bit uh, better care, maybe uh, maybe a little bit less water or perhaps a little bit more sun sunlight, um, it may uh, be uh, go back to health. Um, and so I, I've used the word unhealth uh, to, to talk about this plant in the middle. It actually, unhealth is, is a word. We don't use it uh, very often, but it is, it is a word. Um, and, uh, and, and it describes, I think, a state uh, in between health and disease that we uh, often uh, kind of don't really uh, talk about very much. Um, there's a sense here, if you look at these three plants, that the transition between health and unhealth 
is more uh, reversible, right? More bi-directional. Whereas once you've crossed over into disease, it may be harder uh, to go back. Uh, you have a sense that unless when this plant, for example, were treated with or maybe it looks like perhaps some fungicide or something, that it, would act, it could actually die, right? Now, what about people? Now, of course, we're not plants, right? Uh, we have, we don't, we're not dependent on somebody to sort of water us or, you know, uh, or take care of us. We, we can take care of ourselves, right? And we can make decisions about what we do, what we eat, you know, and, and uh, what, where, we, where, where, we, where we choose to, to, to go and, and do things. But, um, but there are some uh, common themes here between uh, people and the, the plant example that I uh, showed you before. So if you look at this transition between health and disease, um, there is a state here, which uh, we call pre-disease, which I think is very similar to that sort of transition between health and uh, unhealth and disease uh, that I illustrated with the plants. Um, there's that kind of, for a good example of this might be uh, diabetes, right? We know that uh, di there's a, there's a pre-diabetes stage where you're starting to see abnormalities of blood sugar, but uh, you're not quite, uh, there, there's a threshold, right? You decide as to when to actually start uh, diabetes med medication for lowering the blood sugar is, is a bit of a matter of debate right now. Where do you move that line? Uh, where, where, when do you actually start treating diabetes, uh, pre-diabetes as diabetes? And so, uh, but we also know that there is a behavioral phase um, before this um, pre-diabetes, uh, which is essentially uh, the poor diet, weight gain, and at least I'm talking about type two diabetes here, of course, um, where, um, so this is an area where the behavior, right, comes into play. And so could behavioral uh, approaches be helpful at, especially at this pre-disease stage before the abnormalities become uh, so, um, before there's, for example, and organ damage, for example, in, in the case of diabetes. Now, um, the important thing to realize here is that these types of problems do not happen in an isolated fashion. The same type of poor diet that leads that can lead to uh, weight gain and prediabetes can also lead to hyperlipidemia and cardiovascular disease, right? And we know that a lot of the same patients also will have a sedentary lifestyle, and so the same and, and the same weight gain can lead to uh, problems with joints, right? Musculoskeletal pain, degenerative joint disease, which then uh, causes even more problems with. Uh, being able to exercise. Importantly, lack of exercise, uh, we know, and, and poor diets are also associated with psychological stress and poor sleep. Uh, we know that this happens um, it, and, and it's being reinforced by the uh, sort of unhealthy lifestyle. And problems, we know that problems with uh, sleep, especially sleep, are very much part and parcel of people's difficulties with sticking, say, to an exercise program or to a diet. If you're exhausted because you've only had two or three hours of sleep uh, the night before, you're not gonna be motivated to exercise. And of course, you're going to go for that plate of cookies in the afternoon. Um, so all of these problems are related. The only, they're not only related uh, from the behavioral standpoint, we know that there is also some underlying pathophysiological mechanism that links these problems together. And one of these is inflammation. Um, we know that, um, and, and unfortunately, um, right now, we are treating these problems as though they are independent of each other. Uh, and as I showed in the example before, but um, we become, but we also should think about the common threads that uh, may link these problems together. So I mentioned inflammation. Um, there's also, of course, aging, right? We know that as aging is marching along, um, there is an interaction between the sort of the global inflammatory burden uh, of the body and the aging process. And so um, it is very important to sort of say, well, how can we chip away at this? How can we address 
the sources of systemic inflammation that we might be able to do something about. And what would that be? Well, of course, psychological stress, poor diet, sedentary lifestyle. These are three things that we can do something about and that may be able to uh, address some of the problems before they happen or even to reverse them if we catch them early enough at this sort of pre-disease stage. So of course, what are these? Well, we go back to our dietary, psychological, and physical uh, interventions that we talked about earlier. And of course, self-care, very, very important. So this, this approach, of course, um, is, not, uh, is not easy, right? Um, there, it, it's not, uh, for example, uh, some patients, for some patients, uh, medication uh, may be better for them. Uh, it, it, it could be, but it should not, it should be our plan B. It should be our fallback mo uh, motion uh, uh, option. If the um, behavioral and uh, self-care and, and dietary, psychological and physical interventions uh, are, not, uh, are not successful, it uh, should not be the first line. And so the important thing is that we need to be able to support these interventions. Patients are, need help in order to be able to uh, stick to their diets, to exercise safely without hurting themselves, very importantly. And they really need help with dealing with the psychological stress. Um, this is something that is, is difficult and, uh, and, and we should be able to support that. Our healthcare system should support this um, and, uh, and not just automatically uh, go to the pharmacological route. So one of the problems that uh, we're having, uh, in, I think, in research is that because we are, we are using a model where instead, when we, when we look at how a treatment effective is a treatment, we, th we think about it as, as like a drug. When you're, when you're doing research on a specific drug, what you say, what you ask is, does the treatment work? Does the drug work, right? Is the drug doing what it's supposed to be doing? But when you're talking about something like uh, yoga, acupuncture, meditation, we, we tend to ask the same question. We're saying, does acupuncture work or does yoga work? But it's not acupuncture or yoga that's working. It's the patient, right? Not the treatment that is doing the work of healing. The treatment is really facilitating the process. So an important question to ask, I think you can flip this question around and say, what, who are the patients who are more likely to succeed to, to in, 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 in what, what we call patient phenotype, right? Predicts the success of these approaches. And so it's, it, it's this, I think this is a very important question. This may not be for everyone, but if it's possible to identify ahead of time, who are the patients who are more likely to be successful with non-pharmacological approaches, you may able to make an argument for, for example, trying them on covering them with insurance and uh, sort of uh, addressing these problems at a time that at the optimal time, you know, before uh, problems become uh, ir irreversible. So um, I have now sort of described sort of three different aspects of uh, complementary and integrative health, which we have incorporated into our strategic plan. So as you can see here, we've sort of, um, uh, illustrated these in our three letters, uh, C-I-H. So for complementary, uh, we are describing these complementary in interventions as therapies, practices, and systems that use dietary, physical, and or psychological approaches and may have originated outside of conventional medicine, but may be gradually being in integrated uh, into conventional care. For the I, for integration, uh, it, we describe this as ad, uh, advancing research on the whole person and on the integration of complementary and conventional care. So we're talking about integration here in a bigger context. It's not just simply taking conventional and complementary and, uh, treatments and putting them together. It's really thinking in an integrative way, right? Thinking about the whole person and thinking about how all the various domains uh, of, in, of individuals are related to each other. 
And finally, the H for health addresses health promotion and restoration, resilience, disease prevention, and symptom management, focusing on the bi-directional nature of things, how health can move towards disease, but also away from disease and back towards health. So this is this illustration of the whole person health concept that really sort of uh, puts together these various elements. The whole person is the vertical one, the vertical axis here with all of the various different uh, uh, organ systems as well as the different uh, uh, domains of, of, of biopsychosocial domains. And then the, uh, the horizontal axis here of health and disease, meaning that sort of bi-directional uh, uh, flow that can go in either direction. Now we've also il illustrated it uh, in, to in, in a different way, slightly different way to really emphasize the various different planes of social, psychological, and physiological to show really how complex this is and how, uh, how one can really address uh, the whole person health in various different levels. Um, that but importantly, that are all related to each other. So how do we study this? Now, this is important to really consider from the point of view of research. Um, we, in research, we, we, we pay a lot of attention to what we call the negative outcomes, right? Pain, fatigue, functional impairment, disability. We have ways to measure this, but how do you measure when, when things go the other way, right? Uh, physical or emotional, uh, well-being, resilience, stamina. What are the outcomes that are important uh, to, to really understand how do you measure this to make sure that we capture uh, this in our research studies? Um, mechanisms, also extremely important. Because we're focusing so much on disease in medicine, we uh, space, spend so much more attention to things like inflammation, uh, fibrosis, thrombosis, neoplasia, but what about positive mechanisms? Repair, resolution, recovery, regeneration, restructuring, all these wonderful words that start with the letter R. Um, there is some research on this and the basic science things from the point of view, side of things, uh, from the point of view of cellular mechanisms, for example, of re regeneration and, and repair. But how, do, how does, um, uh, for example, the resolution of inflammation how does that relate to, say, uh, a psychological uh, uh, resilience and, and uh, restoration? So I think we have to understand how re health restoration can occur in all of the various different uh, planes, social, psychological, physiological, and, uh, and understanding the mechanisms in a very uh, multi-system and multi-dimensional way. So, um, I, I feel that it, the important thing is that I wanted the, 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 the sense of urgency that I want to convey uh, today is that non, the, the current non-integration of healthcare is an urgent problem that we need to fix, right? And importantly, this is, will not be easy. We understand this because medicine has been unintegrated from the beginning. And this has been reinforced by a century of reliance on drugs for everything. So what we need is whole person health, right? We need to, to integration in the biopsychosocial uh, domain. We need across systems and we need health restoration as well as disease prevention. So um, I want to uh, thank you for your attention. I want to encourage you to uh, connect with us, um, follow us on Twitter and uh, let us know how, uh, how you feel about, uh, about our strategic plan. We are, we're gonna have a strategic planning process that is in, in underway. There's gonna be, we are already has ha have had uh, a um, input as in the form of our request for information back in, uh, in um, June, but there's gonna be more opportunities for public comments on our strategic plan uh, later on in the fall. So thank you very much for your attention. Applause, applause, that is excellent. Thank you so much for an informative and really inspiring presentation. Uh, many people have pointed out, but I think you're doing it eloquently, 
that the National Institutes of Health has long, long been the National Institutes of Disease. So this is a really, I think this is a, an important moment. And we have many, many, many questions, too many that um, then we'll be able to answer here. I wanna point out to people who may cut out a little bit early that I, a recording of this webinar will be on the IHPC website. But um, if, if you have any questions, please uh, go ahead and enter them into the Q&A and uh, I, someone will flash them to me if, and I'll try to squeeze uh, something you know, that's Nobel Prize winning into this set. But um, I want to maybe to begin that um, I think many of our attendees have mentioned that this is, seems to be an important moment and your idea of whole person health and bringing the person to the center is so integral to integrative health and wellness. The idea of patient-centered care, patient-focused, whole person-focused is important. Um, and the NCCIH, you describe as being on the boundary. And that could either be you know, an, a challenge or it could put NCCIH into an ideal situation to advance uh, this shift to working in collaboration with other institutes like the National Heart, Lung and Blood Institute, obviously NIDBK, Diabetes Digestive Diseases, NIDA for some of the behavioral issues associated with the opioid epidemic, the Nursing Institute with their, you know, a whole cadre of holistically trained nurses. I'm wondering, are you supportive of that kind of collaboration? Because ultimately, many of us want to see medicine change to just what you're describing overall. So how do we kind of convert some of them into a more holistic? Approach? Oh, absolutely, Margaret, 100%. Uh, so uh, we have, we start, we already have some strong partnerships in this area. One of those our very strong partners has been the National Institute on Aging. And, and we've been working with NIA now for a long time uh, to, for example, a good example of that is the Healthcare Systems Research Collaboratory, which is a trans NIH uh, initiative that's been led uh, by uh, NCC, co-led by NCCIH and NIA now for, for uh, several years. And it funds uh, clinical studies that are what we call embedded into the healthcare system, pragmatic trials. Now, this, this healthcare systems uh, collaboratory is now graduating. We call it, it was funded by the Common Fund, and now it's, coming, it's going into a second phase, and we're now uh, kind of corralling a lot of different institutes interested in continuing this. And so, yes, so exactly uh, what you're saying, we, we want to uh, start with the institutes, for example, nursing, NIA, uh, NIMHD, Minority Health and, and, and Health Disparities. So these are all institutes that have kind of a, don't have a sort of disease focus. Those are with us for sure. But then we also want to reach out into the institutes that have uh, specific areas of focus like heart, lung and blood, like digestive but that are also have within them areas where they are interested in nutrition and exercise, you know, so there is a natural uh, collaborations that can be set up around the theme of whole person health. And that's already happening. That's really great news. That's sort of big picture. And now I'm gonna drill down into a very specific question, a couple of very specific questions. And um, this is a question that came in is, what is the difference between unhealth as you, you've described it and what is often re referred to in medicine as um, syndromes? And might, what might be the role of immunosenescence in that? You know, you know, oh, yes. it's very interesting. That. Well, there's two pieces to this, right? The senescence piece and also the unhealth. So unhealth I think is a very interesting term. Um, you know, I just threw it out there for the plants. Uh, you know, it's not a term that is used a lot for people. Uh, but I think if we think about the transition between, uh, between uh, say somebody who just has a poor diet versus somebody who's starting to show uh, abnormalities, for example, their blood sh sugar is just starting to increase a little bit or their blood pressure is just starting to be a little bit elevated. Does this person have hypertension that yet no, they wouldn't meet the criteria for hypertension. Are they in a state of unhealth? Well, they, yeah, probably, right? So uh, now, 
I think that you could think about unhealth as, as a state of, 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 of pre-disease. Or you could stay, say you you could talk you could think about it from the point of view of it happens before the disease or it happens sort of that that it comes out of health, <laughs> but the word syndrome is interesting here in the question because a lot of times what people see is these sort of unhealthy kind of constellations of people might be a little tired they may feel not quite well. Um, they don't have as much energy as they used to. They may not sleep as well. Uh, they may gain a little bit of weight. That may constitute a, a, a kind of a picture, right? It's not a disease. Um, is it a syndrome? So, uh, you know, a, 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 um, a, um, uh, we talk about uh, chronic fatigue syndrome, for example. It's not a, a disease because we don't really understand the pathophysiology of it. It's more of a syndrome. And so you may, when we, when we talk about syndromes, usually it's because it's when we don't really know, right, what, what causes something. And so I think it's a good thing to pay attention to these types of syndromes, especially if they fall in the, in the unhealth um, uh, uh, kind of category and really try to understand what is it exactly that's happening with this patient um, in, from a whole person uh, point of view. And that's a, that's a good question for research, right? This is really more basic research. Now, the second part of the question, which was about inflammation and, and sort of um, uh, tied into aging, right? We know that the aging process is associated with chronic inflammation. There's called these senescence-associated secretory phenotypes, which are uh, kind of the, the environment around aging cells uh, is, is both promoted by and also promotes inflammation. So there's a, there's a link between the two, but again, this is an area that is very much uh, uh, in, the, in the process of being understood. Uh, we need to understand a lot better, how does the chronic inflammatory burden of a person, including inflammation coming from various different parts, from, from fat, from, from, from uh, fat uh, cells, from chronic musculoskeletal pain, perhaps even, and musculoskeletal inflammation from chronic stress, how does that influence the aging process? So there's a, there's a lot to learn there. Thank you. That's, it, it, you're right. These are entire areas of research. As a clinical psychologist and behavioral scientist, I want to underscore, it. I'm so pleased to have you bring up the role of behavioral practices because the person is involved in this, things that people can do or are not doing or risks that people are taking or all of that needs to be pulled in. And I'm, I'm thrilled to see your um, attention to that. But drilling out down more, touching on the inflammation piece, um, can you discuss any research? And I know this touches closely in an area that you've been focusing on um, into fascia and how that might be a pathway that we haven't focused on. What role might that play in such things as inflammation? Well, thank you for mentioning fascia because this is an area I think which is very, very interesting because when you think about fascia, it is part of the musculoskeletal system, right? It, it's, it's what surrounds all our bones, our muscles. Every time you move, you're, you're pulling your fascia you're, you're, and the fascia supports everything. But it's also part of the immune system. We don't always think about that. When you say, what is the immune system, right? It's a bunch of cells that are going around, you know, looking for trouble, right? What do they do when, they, when these cells leave the blood vessels? They go into what we call the extracellular space. Well, it's not really space. It's connective tissue. That's where they go. That's where a lot of immune responses take place. It's inside connective tissue. So in my own lab, that's what we study is the in interaction between the musculoskeletal system and the immune system via movement and particularly stretching. We're really important, interested in the importance of stretching. If you actually put a mechanical force on the connective tissue, how does that influence the immune responses? Fascinating, fascinating. Um, we're, we're getting tight on time here. I uh, want to ask you, uh, in your talk, you, you described in your vision that we should point the arrow back at the patient um, and make this more patient-centered. And I'm wondering, as a as you know, an MD and thinking about practice, just 
you know, and I know that and CCIH doesn't study policy, but you are studying implementation science. But I'm wondering if you have any thoughts about how, how this could, could be put into practice as we learn more about all of the little circles with the patient in the center. How might, how might that work? If you, or is that something we should be studying? What's the role of the, the massage therapist, the holistic nurse, the acupuncture, how to, and the patient. I often think of the patient is the really the captain of the team. Uh, but I just wonder if you could muse on that just a bit as we're about yeah. to unfold. Yeah. Well, there's, there's very important elements here. One is the patient centeredness and the other one is the multimodal piece, right? So if you think about this in a whole person way, clearly it's not just gonna be one thing right? You're going to have to address whatever the, the person is experiencing in that moment. What is, what is the constellation, constellation of what is constituting this person's syndrome right now, right? What is going on in this patient? And address it in, in as much of a multimodal, multifaceted way as you can. So this goes back to these multimodal approaches. Teams of, of, of healthcare that are looking at this patient and, and interacting. And so this is where research is, is, is challenging, right? I've talked about you know, doing research in a healthcare setting. Well, how do you study a multimodal approach? This requires developing research methods that will be both rigorous, but also sophisticated, that will need to uh, kind of ad adapt and understand how do you do research on say a multimodal therapy? So, well, this is one of the things that we are looking at very uh, uh, carefully in our new strategic plan is to how can we best support this kind of research that is going to address uh, the whole patient in, in ways that are just as rigorous as if you were studying, you know, a pill, for example. Thank you so much. Um, we're getting so many questions. One area I think we really might want to talk with you about, perhaps we can do another one of these in H HPC Connects on COVID. As we learn more about COVID and recovery from COVID and what is the role of complementary and integrative health and at those margins, because this disease seems to really be a whole person disease, not just breathing, but the digesting, the things you were talking about um, are all there um, so I may, we may be getting back in touch with you to have you come back. But now I, I really do want to thank today's speaker, Dr. Langevin, for her visionary leadership um, that's really moving the integrative health community forward. And thrilled to see you bringing in, you know, so many of our studies have been things like mindfulness versus CBT. And sometimes CBT came out a little stronger. But your idea of how could we look at the person and see some people I know, I referred to mindfulness, but they were uncomfortable in that group setting and referred them over to CBT and they thrive, vice versa. So there's so much that we need to learn. So I want to thank you so much and to tell all of the attendees um, here at our, our session, thank you so much. This um, is being recorded and will be on uh, the IHPC web night, uh, web website, <laughs> early morning. Uh, I want to thank our, also thank our sponsors, uh, the Samueli Foundation, Sapphire Essentials, Upledger Institute, and Cairo Secure. But finally, I really want to thank all of you who've attended today, which includes over 600 registrants from the, the throughout the country and Capitol Hill. Everyone, please stay safe. Stay, stay healthy and stay tuned for briefings from our ongoing series, IHPC Connects. Thank you all and have a great day.